Welcome to Career in Ruins, where this week we've been invited by the Undergraduate Anthropology Society at Stony Brook University in New York to talk about our career in ruins. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction, Mason, and thank you all um, in terms of the, um, the, the the committee and all of you for inviting us to come and, and talk to you. Well, I guess it's your afternoon, it's our evening here in the UK, but um, I, I think when Han messaged us uh, quite some time ago now, um, I mean, we got very excited about this pros- prospect of uh, crossing crossing the Atlantic and um, and imparting some some knowledge. I think I will start this lecture with a disclaimer that 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 was used for the book drive. In that I don't think we're too old that our information is incorrect. But if it is, then um, please choose to ignore anything that we that we tell you during this. Um, as as we said at the start, we are going to be recording um, myself and Derek talking, and we're going to hopefully turn it into a podcast episode afterwards. I guess that leads me to to start off by saying welcome to Career in Ruins. Um, I'm I'm Lawrence Shaw, and um, Derek's joining me as well. And we, we've sort of been given quite a loose brief to talk to you about um, science communication, um, how we got into the podcast, and we kind of wanted to go on a bit of a journey of how we got to um, where we are today with with regards to what Career in Ruins is, and um, it's some some of the bonus things that have have come out of of setting up Career in Ruins and and sort of the the fun things that can come out of science communication in different media formats. What what's quite cool as well, and what we're going to try and touch on is, um, and we're we, we're going to try and keep true to the podcast itself in that we, we want to talk about career and ruins, but and we very rarely get to talk about our own career and ruins. The, the whole point of our podcast is that we want to learn and and hear about other people's trajectories and and um, roots to where they got to be where they are today in terms of being a professional um, and we are going to touch on our own um, career in ruins but it, it it's sort of what's quite nice is that whilst Derek and I are best buds and then we hang out in our spare time and and we've got a lot of interests at the same we've got quite different trajectories in terms of our professional careers so whereas Derek is an associate professor at the de- and deputy head of department at Bournemouth University and it's all academic and, and stuff like that um, I'm the lead historic environment advisor so I, I work in heritage management and I, we, we, we it's all about sort of um, managing protecting and promoting our historic environment in, in the nation's forest so um, we have very different roles different jobs but we often cross over and it doesn't mean that we should be siloed. And I think that's going to be something that we, t- we touch on a lot throughout it, it just because you're, you're an academic or just because you're a government employee or just because you're a commercial archeologist um, doesn't mean that you can't work together and you can't um, do cool and fun things. That's absolutely right. And I, I must admit when, <clears throat> excuse me, when we started talking to Han about doing this lecture, it, it made me think a little bit, and I think it made both of us think about how how we got to the point where we decided to make a podcast and be science communicators. And I must confess that on thinking about it in detail, it wasn't necessarily as planned as you may think it was. <laughs> um, in fact, a lot of a lot of the trajectory that got us to where we are and to talking to you guys today kind of came through uh, just a mix of events and interactions and scenarios, which while we may have taken some opportunities along the way, kind of it, it happened very organically. So it, it forced both of us, I think, to think about questions about why why we chose to communicate our discipline, our subject, things that we we love to talk about and love so much, and what it is that made us want to, want to do it, um, how we got into it, and importantly, I think, and this is something hopefully we can impart some some aging wisdom maybe um where the skills came from to do it and the answer to all of these questions the more the more we thought about it the more we went into detail kind of 
ties into ourselves a bit and as Lawrence said we, we tend not to make the podcast about ourselves it tends to be about the people we meet and the people we talk to that was one of our philosophies from the beginning but in terms of developing it in terms of building the skill set in terms of building the the platform to do it it's so intertwined with our careers we felt like today might be a good opportunity to be a little self-indulgent and follow that train of thought through um, our own careers in ruins and actually take a moment to think about the last 10 or so years and and how we 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 have arrived here today talking to you guys at lunchtime in new york from the evening in southern britain so we wanted to think a little bit about um, the journeys that we've been on, as, De- as Derek mentioned, um, the, the sort of research interests that we've, we've, we've acquired and that, we, that have grown since we've been set in your own positions in terms of lowly, lowly undergrads and, and the things but that perhaps even shaped our, um, our decisions to go and do an archaeology and anthropology degree in the first place and, and what our drivers have been. So what our research interests are, what our personal interests are, how we became um, specialists and, and built specialisms. Um, and the fact that something we always talk about in the podcast, which is, is something we believe quite dearly, is that you make your own luck. And when it comes to science communication as well, there, there's an element of of going out and doing it for yourself and um, going about it the right way. You don't force it, but as long as you're enthusiastic and you're happy and you're hardworking, then good things will come with it. And um, and that that that's something that we that we hold quite dear to everything that we do in terms of career ruins and and, and other things that have come out of that. So we thought we'd start at the beginning. And again, this gets very introspective now because we can think about where, where we came from and, and where, where this all began. And for me, I mean, I, I, I never intended to be an archaeologist. It was never, never my game plan. Um, I certainly never intended to be a podcaster. Heck, podcasts were, what, 20 or 30 years away when I was growing up. Um, I can't imagine what the world will be like when my kids are my age. Sorry, that's a digression. Um, but uh, when uh, when I was um, when I was younger, all I wanted to do was you can see behind me and probably Lawrence as well play the guitar, sing songs, and become a rock star. And that that's that's what it's all about, really, for me. Um, it was never never about being a scientist, being an academic, doing anything like that. I was probably the most opposite to an academic individual you can meet, and I guess you can probably tell that from hearing me talk gibberish at the moment. Um, but I, I I I never wanted to be a public speaker. I never wanted to do any of the, the kind of stuff we find ourselves doing now. Certainly not when I was growing up. But that said, there were there were seeds looking back with the benefit of hindsight, things like I really enjoyed geology. I really enjoyed the kind of the deep time um, understanding that came with that. I was a massive nerd growing up and massively into Stargate, SG-1 particularly, and Star Trek. The idea of seeing pasts and futures um, always appealed to me. And ultimately, when it came to failing as a musician and deciding I needed to go and study something or get a job in an electronics factory, I was drawn to a subject that wasn't boring. And that that lack of boredom, I think, is something that has permeated through um, my early career to today and trying to make this discipline that I love as exciting as possible. So other people like me who are kind of wandering, drifting around from terrible job to terrible job um, into something they want to do and something they want to be a part of. And that that's something that I, I've kind of kept with me. Um, but I was also very fortunate. I, I can't lie. I can't sit here and say I, I didn't have an amazing upbringing in rural England. Um, as a as a kid, I was exposed to archaeological excavations that happened to go through the farm that my parents rented. Um, so I, I got to see archaeology from a young age. So it was always something that was in my imagination, in in my kind of world view. And I think that that positioning of archaeology and anthropology in people's world views, more than anything else, is something I, I still think is important and I still value and I I hope as as science communicators both Lawrence and I do from time to time but those those were my origins and I I think uh, are they similar to yours Lawrence yeah let's let's be honest (laughs) we've got whilst there's a few years between us we've got a very similar upbringing (laughs) so um yeah very much grew up on the south coast beautiful south downs archaeology coming out coming and history and heritage coming out is um weekends spent mooching around Roman villas and Iron Age hill forts with my parents and sort of 
feigning that I didn't really like it, but actually I did quite like it. And um, and then just naturally picking up subjects in college that look like ancient history, archaeology, geography, geology, and, and IT, and sort of that, that IT bit, and getting a bit m- much like Derek. I'm, I'm a nerd, and I, I wanted to look at these subjects. I wanted to learn about these things, and I wanted to... Um, start thinking about how I could apply IT to these subjects as well quite early and and m- much like Derek fortunate to have experiences so in college I went I took a trip to Egypt and um and I mean that's always gonna any any sort of trips like that are really gonna spark an interest but if I'm not if I wasn't doing that I was out with the scouts and out and about and just generally looking at stuff and, and appreciating uh, the landscape I think that's where my my landscape interests came from but um yeah it as with both of us, I think early, our early lives have really shaped to get us where where we where we are today. I I never wanted to be a rock star. I think I always knew I was going to be an archaeologist. Um, but um, hopefully, I'm a rock star archaeologist. I don't know. Derek, you can think. <laughs> That's optimistic, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I mean, that, that's just a brief overview. But to give you an idea of, I mean, being a nerd's cool. And being able to being a, being being passionate and embracing your childhood enthusiasms, and um, really doing what you love and following what you love will result in great outputs and great enthusiasm and an ability to sell your passions. And I think that's what Derek and I can do quite well. I I, I hope anyway. I guess that both led us to then the same point but at different times as, as Lawrence mentioned and he likes to repeatedly mention he's a little bit younger than me um, so we we didn't necessarily cross paths in our in our early years um, but we did both study at the same university a place actually that I'm I consider myself incredibly privileged to be teaching at now um, and it was really studying at university and studying particularly at Bournemouth University that I I I don't say this lightly, but it changed my life in a way that I'd never have fully imagined studying a degree in BSc Archaeology with Honours ever could. Um, I, as I said, I, I, it wasn't really on in my plan at the time. I was aware of archaeology. I was aware of what it was, but I didn't really know what studying it would entail and the, the, the ins and outs of stratigraphy and understanding material culture and um, the anthropology of humanity and none of that in my mind I guess it was digging holes in Indiana Jones and I suppose that is how it is to a lot of people Um, but I remember so vividly the the fact that a Bournemouth let me in despite the fact I was academically awful Um, I can't beat around the bush I was dreadful at school I was a terrible terrible pupil at school Um, thankfully a bit better student when it came to being at university Um, so they took me in uh, as a punt essentially and in on the first day I remember sitting in my first lecture at university and thinking this is the best decision I've ever made this is this is unreal and it it changed my life hugely and being able to be back there now hopefully doing that for other people who again we we have excessively low entry standards so um (laughs) if any Bournemouth University students are listening to the edited version of this I don't mean that (laughs) Um, (laughs) but uh I I hope that people like me can kind of come in and find a love for a subject that I found love for but also a love for learning and investigating and researching things um so I graduated in 2016 um just as Lawrence was starting his degree um, um, we didn't ever meet, but we would have been in the same bars at the same time, I suspect, at one point or another. Um, and yeah, I, I, it, it sparked a few interests for me at the time, um, particularly an interest in travelling. And uh, that's something that I, I hadn't, I'd never left the country before university. I'm a little farm boy. I, I was happy, happy in my southern Britain. Um, but I, I, I discovered that going away is really nice and working abroad is really nice and being around the world and visiting new places, seeing new cultures and new ideas in a way that you never get on holiday. If you if you go for a couple of weeks on holiday, you might have a nice pina colada on a beach somewhere. But the chances of actually meeting people who live there and work there and have different ideas and different views to you doesn't happen but when you go for five or six weeks on a field school suddenly it's very different and you can you can 
connect with places in a way that um, I don't I don't think you can get in any other way. So I, I fell in love with that element of the discipline, and that's something I've been very fortunate that I've I've carried on. And I had a placement back in two thousand and five, just as you were starting your degree, I think, Lawrence, um, where I managed to luck my way onto a project in Greece and had, it was my first time abroad, um, Northern Greece. Everyone told me at the time, it's okay, everyone in Greece speaks English. No worries, you'll be fine. Um, it turns out that was wrong. Um, and also there's a whole other alphabet that I had to learn. Um, but thankfully, oh no, no, mobile phones didn't exist at the time. I got there, I got there in the end and had a great time and fell in love with, with, international archaeology and that's that's something I'm still very keen on pursuing. I think also that that fieldwork aspect and that that ability to learn to identify our interests in, in an under, undergraduate degree a helped us to identify our what we wanted to get more passionate in specialize in things like um, material culture in Derek's instance and both our sides mapping landscape survey technology but um, yeah I was fortunate enough to go to the uh, I think Mason mentioned the Stonehenge Riverside project in our introduction and the, I spent I was there for two, in 2000 and 2005 and you're looking at 400 people on an excavation for five weeks camping in a field um in this world heritage site and suddenly you you you're seeing what it's all about you you, you're getting it in terms of being part of this big project learning new skills talking to people learning learning from them um to get, getting new perspectives and learning how to communicate with people as well not both within our discipline but also members of the public as they walk past and that that was sort of a, and also working in northern ireland for a little while as in a placement year as well so um yeah it all it all started to help shape where we where we get to but then I, from my perspective, I came out of university into the global, into a global recession to so 2008. And to get any jobs in archaeology, you needed at least six months commercial experience. I was lucky to get a three months job and then everyone lost their jobs and um, they weren't going to take an, a, a fresh undergraduate with three months digging experience um, in any commercial job. So I, actually, I then had to spend um, two years working in bars and call centres um, to try and work out what it is I wanted to do. And during those two years really helped me in a whole host of reasons, not least make me realise this isn't what I want to be doing. I want to be doing archaeology and therefore I need to make that happen for me because no one's employing a guy that's just out of university with with um, three months professional experience. I've done lots of placements and things like that, but really it, when you've got loads of other people scrambling for jobs, it's not going to happen. So it made me work out how I was going to carve out my career for myself. If, if I'm going to have to get, if I want to jump back on the train that I love so much, I'm going to have to make it happen. And that resulted in doing volunteering in my spare time. And that involved working on digitization projects and going out and doing field work and um, just making, making the most use of my spare time to be able to um, change my work time. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, having fun in my spare time doing archaeology. I'm having fun in my job doing archaeology. Um, and things like the Stonehenge Riverside Project really helped. I'd stayed present in at Bournemouth University at the time and was going in and volunteering and, and learning new digitisation techniques and mapping. Um, and I just made, made myself kind of ever present. And I, I made people realise I was capable and, and I could do jobs and... Um, I made sure I was in the right place at the right time and keeping in people's minds. So when opportunities came up, which they often do at universities, small pots of money um, to deliver small projects, um, I, I, was in, I was sort of there and people knew that I could do it. And as a result, I got um, a research position on a student training dig, um, trench director for the Jurotrigus Big Dig. And I was that for, I sort of would go along and work with students, teach them how to dig, also learn how to communicate with, with, with students and teach them how to be enthusiastic about this new subject that they just started as first year undergraduates. But also I worked on a project called Seeing Beneath Stonehenge, which was a Google Earth funded project. And uh, we received money from Google to digitise all the Seeing Beneath, um, all the Stonehenge Riverside project and make it available online on, on Google Earth. And it was all spatial data, 3D images, um, videos narration and it it made me start to think about how you 
produce material uh, in an openly accessible way that is understandable for non-specialists. And we started to look at social media and, and Twitter and other and Facebook and and schools projects. We go in and teach them how to use these these products. And there's a really cool uh, internet archaeology paper about that. So if you want to know about sharing spatial data on Google Earth, you can check that out. But um, I think the, the crux of it was very hard start to my career in terms of staying in the profession. Uh, and that's not least because I got a lovely tutu and I wasn't I, I spent too much time rowing and drinking and not enough time studying hard when I was an undergraduate. But at the same time, I'd learned what I wanted to do and I knew what I needed to get back onto that train. So, yeah, I sort of ploughed my, my own furrow and made sure I was I learned the skills I, and I could communicate with colleagues and I could get back to where I wanted to be. It's interesting when we were putting these slides together that um, there's odd parallels emerge between Lawrence and my career, which I wasn't quite aware of at the time. Um, I was a bit luckier than Lawrence being being that much older. Um, I'd, <laughs> I'd graduated just before the global economic recession. Um, so I, I managed to walk into a job with barely an interview because they were desperate for people. Um, I probably wouldn't have got it otherwise. Um, and spent an amazing year working in, in the world of commercial archaeology, um, which in the UK is basically whenever anything's being built, archaeological investigations happen beforehand, and commercial companies are brought in to do the archaeological mitigation and investigation work. Um, and I had, honestly, one of the best years of my life. Um, I, I worked on a huge number of interesting infrastructure projects. Um, some of the weather conditions were not favourable, as you can see in one of the pictures there. Um, it was it was uh, a little bit of a interesting climate to do archaeology all year round in Britain. You have to get very used to the rain, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but I, it, was a, it was an amazing year. But in a similar vein to Lawrence, the longer I worked in, in the field, the more I started to understand what I wanted to do. And the career tra trajectory of, of a field archaeologist at the time was very much you become more of a manager, then you become more of an administrator, and then you, you become increasingly more detached from doing archaeology and thinking about archaeology. And for me at the time, talking about archaeology, which is something I was enjoying doing more and more. Um, so I realised that that probably wasn't for me, but if I wanted to do anything else in the discipline, if I wanted to actually do the archaeology and ask the questions rather than um, organise teams of people to answer them, then I'd need to do something different with my life. And that's what led me to kind of continue in, in education. So I went back to university to do an MSc in archaeo materials, um, which I definitely didn't spell right on the slide. Um, apologies for that. Um, um, there's a moral here about two dyslexic archaeologists giving a talk about <laughs> communicating archaeology. Um, but I, 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 yeah, so I, I went on to do a, uh, a master's that led me to the University of Sheffield, which is actually where, <clears throat> for me, Lawrence mentioned landscape as a big influence to him. I was never that into landscape archaeology until this point, but I started to fall in love with it as a subject. But I know that you, Lawrence, were there very much into the landscape. Yeah. And uh, you make a good point about, so you, you mentioned that you, you decided you wanted to change that or make make that change and you identified your masters being the point of of change and that that's very much the same for me in terms of I actually I we we've, we've been really fortunate to work with some great people over the years and what one of the people who's been incredible is professor Kate Wellham at Bournemouth University and I remember sitting down with her on a field feed, field season when I'm sort of bouncing between short term contracts at the university I was like I want to do this for a living how can I do this she's like well you got to you got to get a masters um, and you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get a good grade. Um, and yeah, and I was like, okay. So I started saving up, and I went to the University of of, of Birmingham. And much like you've seen with the slides so far, I true to form, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what my interests were, and I went and did it in a master's form. So landscape archaeology, GIS, and virtual environments. So um, all those A levels that I showed you at the beginning, my college, my college things, just coming coming to play, but honing them in even more in terms of my my interests and my specialisms um and that brought with it a whole bunch of additional work placements which, which um included working on the stonehenge environs project where we were going up and down um the stonehenge avenue on quad bikes with multi-array geophysical equipments and state-of-the-art laser scanners on scaffold poles and 
uh, sort of open my eyes to the opportunity of new, uh, new and developing survey equipment that you, I just hadn't even seen up until that point and met new professionals, met new professors, um, world experts and just built that communicate that 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 network and that that ability and it became abundantly clear that being able to talk to people in an open and friendly but a sensible manner that doesn't put them off is such a beneficial tool to have in your back pocket because you then start getting invited on projects you start getting added to um to discussions and that just unraveled and became better and better so during that we had the um we had worked on the Stonehenge pro- project with, with the University of Birmingham and the Volts uh, Ludwig Foundation. Um, but also because I'd had those two years or so of working in call centres and, and not doing what I wanted to do, I was able to really focus down and narrow it. I, I knew this is what I wanted so I could treat it like a job. I could work really hard and I could just improve my work ethic a lot, a lot more. And this was really when I started to think about innovation in archaeology as well and working, going to a new place, going to a different department, which is focused ever so slightly in, in interests or, or specialisms. Bournemouth, um, Birmingham was very much about computers and technologies. I started to, th- you, you were in, we were encouraged to think about innovation. And this is when I'm, I did my master's on, and at the time it was cutting edge, but it's rubbish now. It's looking at apps and how people can use apps to learn about archaeology. Um, so out that they're really good but um at the time it was sort of you started thinking outside the box and, and thinking about ways of of um first second and third place thinking in terms of you don't just give them scientific data you give them a bit more and, and how, how do people consume this information and that was a good good turning point um loads of new practical skills but then also just job opportunities so as a result of doing that masters i then went i flew out to qatar and spent three months as the historic environment records officer for the whole country and setting up a database for them and then um came flew straight back and went out to easter island and was doing geophysical survey works on easter island for a month um and then came back and then picked up loads of extra cover work at bournemouth university because um i'd got more skills and more experiences and more qualifications and it all started to snowball from completion of this master's so it was it was a really positive time i've just noticed Lawrence, you are much more calculating than me in your career so far i i, I just float <laughs> around looking for new things to try and hope for the best um <laughs> i'm glad i found you in my life <laughs> i've got um, a plan for you mate don't worry <laughs> but for me i mean i i when i started the master's again i i kind of had an idea i i enjoyed material culture i enjoyed the fact that people making things gives a very unique insight into understanding both individuals or communities groups um and whole kind of uh cultures but i i kind of used my masters to try a whole bunch of new and different things um i i started to read up and do a lot of work and research around weirdly the bronze age of western siberia why not um some some colleagues in the department um and in fact one of my uh, long-term collaborators from the University of Pittsburgh, Brian Hanks, um, were working on a project in in Central Eurasia, um, in Western Siberia, and I, I fell in love with the archaeology and I fell in love with the idea of of working there and, and investigating it and recreating it. Um, I learned how to do experimental archaeology, um, and this was where I really fell in love with the landscape as well. I spent a lot of time with geographers, which was a new thing for me. Lawrence was already hanging out with him at this stage of his life, I suspect. But um, I was I was opening my eyes to the prospect of um, putting these production-y things that I was so excited about in a spatial landscape context, and it got it it probably nudged my career in directions I wasn't quite prepared for, but have been pretty beneficial in hindsight. Um, but at the time, the experimental archaeology was what drove me closer to the public. Um, I, I was doing a PhD, but I was self-funded. Um, I was doing it full-time, which I don't recommend you do a self-funded PhD full-time because you end up working loads and loads and loads to make the money to do the PhD that you have no time to do. Um, but I tried very hard to use 
to make money by doing archaeological things. And one way I learned you could make money was by doing demonstrations of iron smelting and copper smelting. So I did a lot of um, schools outreach and working with various um, local organisations and groups, um, basically showing them how to make metal from stones, which was great. But it also gave me a chance to explain quite complex scientific and chemical principles in a way that anyone can understand and that's probably my first real taste of, of um, public engagement with with the detail of science um, I also took the chance to learn how to make pots I'm still not very good at it but it was it was good fun um, and yeah for, throughout my time at Sheffield from masters and continuing to do my PhD I took the opportunities that were available um, and that's probably a the the element of making your own luck that Lawrence mentioned at the beginning is it's not necessarily you, you you don't automatically work hard and good things happen to you that's that's a very um kind of airy philosophy for life but when opportunities to pre present themselves to be in a position where you can say yes and embrace them it's kind of the the philosophy I think we're, we're going for there um and one of those opportunities for me was to go and do six years or six seasons worth of um uh, international field work in Russia, which again, I'd still not really traveled very much at this stage. I'd only just been to Greece a few years before, hadn't been abroad since. Um, so to then spend six years working in a place that at the time felt incredibly alien to me, um, was a, a huge life changing process to go through. But again, it, it, it would have been very easy when the, the professors who were working in that region spoke to me and said, are you interested in doing some data collection in the field alongside um, your your lab work? Bearing in mind, I was doing kind of material science with electron microscopes and stuff at the time. Um, they basically said, oh, I hear you learned how to do geophysics recently. Do you want to come and do that on the project? And because I was in a position to say yes, because I'd taken the opportunities to learn some skills while I could, I could say yes. And it gave me the most amazing research opportunity. I got my national television debut on uh, Russia One there, uh, which wasn't the, the best of performances, but the, the dubbed version of me has a very powerful voice, which I, I quite liked watching back. Um, and uh, yeah, and I got to do some some great geophysics. Um, I got to do my first, it was kind of a, a first professional gig in landscape archaeology. But to, to be able to do it was because I put myself in a position where I could say yes to those things. And that's, that's something that's kind of permeates right up to, I don't know, landing proper jobs, I guess. Yeah, lovely segue, pal, lovely segue. Thanks, <laughs> um, and yeah, so for going on from, from my previous slide, at least, um, so in 2020, in 2012, I landed my first job, proper job, which was um, a permanent post working in the New Forest National Park Authority. So the New Forest is one of 15 national parks in the UK. Compared to American national parks, they're pretty rubbish, but um, they're great quite small in terms of well, right? yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> really. it's, it's love. It's got it's got ponies. Everyone loves ponies, but um, it's it's yeah, it was great. And what it was is that I spent eight years working in an organisation that was about celebrating a national asset and all aspects that fall within that. So trees wildlife random ponies that are only found in this location the archaeology and the breadth of history that come from the paleolithic all the way through to the second world war so we've got beautiful prehistoric burial mounds in the bottom right corner there um but also the biggest bomb we've ever dropped on ourselves are just found in the middle of this national park during this it was done in the second world war so really really rich history and my, my job in 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 this eight years was to um, look at remote sensing data called LIDAR, so 3D mapping. We were first national park to have blanket LIDAR coverage. Um, and it was my job to identify lost and forgotten archaeological monuments within the national park and then go out with volunteers, local communities and go and map them on the ground. Make sure it was a prehistoric bar barrow and not a, a pile of brash or um, a rhododendron bush. So um, that was a really good starting point because what I had to learn to do was talk to average people and make them understand quite complex science in the form of remote sensing lidar how does lidar work it's just like a dropping a ping pong ball uh, okay they can understand that and the speed it comes back that's like a 3d point yeah it, um and then actually teaching them how to do archaeological survey and do it in a meaningful way you can't just 
squiggle it so no one can understand your handwriting um, you do have to spend an extra five minutes to record it correctly and this is why because it adds to x y and z it allows us to protect it allows us to tell a story it allows us to tell a narrative um, but also working within the organization are you, we were able to develop other things like outreach programs um, and on the top left corner there there's a picture of a family during a dig digital heritage exhibition that which, which we did and that was that looked at developing a giant touchscreen with um, where people can digitize lidar features there were 3d reconstructions based on archaeological sites found that were produced by Bournemouth University uh, uh, computer game students that I brought along and, and taught them about um, we did citizen science projects where people went out and recorded historic tree graffiti in our in our forests um, and then we also looked at ways of changing our survey techniques and so moving away from writing and with paper and using ipads things that are just commonplace now but at the time they cost a lot of money and no one trusted that they'd work in in the middle of the deepest darkest forest so trying to push the boundaries change the way we work with it and and being in a really supportive positive place and but if we can go on to the next slide, please, Derek. The, the one thing that I learned, which is, is still my biggest takeaway and still why I think Career in Ruins has is, is, is worked so well and, and Time Team and other things like that for me is that I learned that if you're in the, even if you're not in the right job, you should always be thinking about how you can make your job work for you. And if you if you if you love your job and you love if you're passionate about your your interests, you're going to do a great job. That that's a no brainer, and your employer are going to get loads of great things out of you as a result of that. In terms of um, enthusiasm and going an extra mile and coming up with new ideas and getting excited about what you could do, but in return you need that employer to invest in you and so making sure that you're identifying every possible opportunity that can enhance you and that they can benefit from in this in the same way became really apparent to me and this is something that I still hold true today in my current job but that includes get, making sure you're getting decent training so I got them to te give me a drone qualification and then I could capture popular media I could do 3D recording I do archaeological survey I could do photogrammetry but also I could get lovely drone shots and videos photos of archaeological sites and I could share those on Twitter and allow people to to see the archaeology from another prospect um I I learned how to engage with volunteers and, and work with the public I I became a visiting research fellow at Bournemouth University and absolutely made the most of that. So I'd go in, I'd borrow the geophysics equipment and I'd go and do a geophysics survey in the New Forest. I'd set, um, I'd work with computer game students. I'd work with the archaeological um, society um, to do surveys and whatnot. So loads of benefits of going to another institution. You bleeding them dry for as much things as you need. But the uni university loved it as well because they're getting outreach, they're getting impact and they're getting benefits from a government or agency, a national park, and they're getting... We, and we do lots of media coverage of all this work. So LIDAR sells really... The public love LIDAR. It's a lovely magical laser technique that allows us to see beneath trees and find archaeology. Sells really easy. So you can get onto... You can do press releases. You can, you can talk about tree graffiti. You can be absolutely shameless like Derek and I were... And you can create a brand new geophysical technique where you, these special ponies that we have in the new forest, you strap, rather than using a quad bike, you use a pony to pull a geophysical array um, across Heathland that you're not meant to drive cars on. And we do a geophysical survey of a medieval hunting lodge and you invite the local media team down just purely for a photo. Uh, that that a photo was pretty opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, but the resources were there. And so, and the authority didn't mind because they were getting media coverage and we were being innovative and we were trying new stuff. The university didn't mind because their kit was being used. We were looking after it and they were getting media coverage. And I didn't mind because I was having loads of fun. I was hanging out with pals. I was meeting new people. I was having lots of um, learning new skills. Um, but it wasn't necessarily my job. But I was going. I was pushing the boundaries, but I was making the job work for me. And I was making sure I was going to conferences. I was making sure I was collaborating. I was always asking the question, could I do this? Or... Um, but also I'd, I'd ask for forgiveness. So if, if, if they'd say no, 
I'd probably still do it anyway. It would work well. I, I'd only do this if I knew it was going to work well, but, and then I'd ask for forgiveness afterwards because it, it all kind of worked out. So sometimes don't always ask, ask, for, ask permission, ask for forgiveness ask afterwards. But, and this continued to push my innovation. And um, that, this is when I started my, my part-time PhD. So whilst funding a full-time PhD is, does sound like a terrible idea, Derek, as well, doing, doing a part-time PhD when you're working a full-time job is also a terrible idea idea but um and all of this all of this taking opportunities use, using volunteer days to go and work on other research projects I, w- I went to um work in spain one of the first times i met derek i was working in spain with him and i went for two weeks and i got two of those days were work days because we, we get paid to volunteer for two days so i said i was volunteering on a geophysical survey in in southern spain so always and when I first started the job in the new forest when they offered it to me I said yeah I will start I know you're desperate like they were kind of desperate for someone to start because someone just left but I said but you have to let me go to Easter Island in January um and you don't have to pay me but you have to let me leave for a month because I'm going to go out I've already been asked to go on this project and I said yeah that's fine so asking a project making sure it works for you and then just making the most of it and it's it's not being selfish it's not being cheeky because everyone benefits from it but it's easy to be scared to ask those questions and push those boundaries and a lot of this helped me to get the job the national role that i'm in now so forestry england largest manager land manager in england uh 250,000 hectares of land uh 100,000 known sites and monuments thousand scheduled monuments listed buildings parks and gardens and i sort of get to oversee it now and i get to imply all this stuff that i did in the new forest but on a national scale and that all of this has helped me to to land that job i i i i'd say yeah i mean in, in contrast to lawrence i've probably only had a proper job for about four years it took a it took a much longer um time to to uh, settle in um but i think that's what happens sadly when you choose a job in academia there's many years of uncertainty uh, which follows um but there's there are a few lessons i learned along the way and while while we're here talking about science communication i thought i couldn't resist the opportunity to try and give some sage wisdom if i can about pursuing a career in in academia in higher education um and hopefully um help other folks who may be going through this in in the next few years um but uh, as as with Lawrence, I was spending time making making whatever role I was in work for me. So when I was at um, finishing up my PhD, um, and in fact another way I made a bit of money on the side to fund it um, was running field schools for Sheffield students because I realised that they would pay a set fee per head per student and I could probably feed them really cheaply, put them up in a field for free and sc- just skim some money off the top to pay for my fees that year um so i, I spent two years um basically hustling my department to pay Is for my the fees. tax man i hear at the front door um, I, I i was fully <laughs> fully tax returned while while finishing up i saw an ad for a, a job at bournemouth and while while we've been talking about making your own luck sometimes sometimes luck does come your way and i was pretty proficient by this time in the study of archaeological materials and i was a pretty proficient field archaeologist and then suddenly a sabbatical cover popped up uh for a job in those two exact things and it the timing couldn't have been more perfect i was living 40 minutes away at the time and it it seemed perfect Little did I know, <laughs> um, and I found this out many, many years later, um, one of our colleagues had um, not necessarily conspired in my favour, but I, I can't help but think that maybe they did conspire to put this together at the right time and th- things fell into place. So maybe there was a bit of making making my own luck in that, um, as Lawrence said, being nice, being available, being open for opportunity, saying yes when people want you to um, help them out and do interesting things may have, may have helped out here. But that first job was a steep learning curve. I think I was teaching 16 to 22 hours of new material every week, um, covering for two full-time academics um, straight out of a PhD with, at the time, and please don't listen to this, any of my then employers, um, I hadn't had quite that as much experience as I may have led them to believe I had. Um, But anyway, um, it was a steep learning curve and it actually taught me a lesson that I can't help but think I wouldn't have learned any other way. And this is probably not the most helpful bit of advice in the world, but in having to prepare material, basically in preparing a two-hour lecture an hour before and then preparing another two-hour lecture four hours later, it 
gave me skills in saying things out loud without thinking too much in advance and just talking through things and hoping for the best and generally winging it in a way that I don't think I would have ever got if I hadn't gone through that process um, to the point where stick any old slide in front of me now and I can say something. Um, and that's that's kind of one of the basic baseline skills that's led, it's led, it, led me to getting into podcasting and, and doing various TV things. And it's a skill that I don't think I had before. Um, uh, in fact, I was incredibly shy. I still am incredibly shy. Even before this lecture, I was well nervous. I was um, texting Lawrence um, that I was, oh, I'm really nervous about this. Oh God, I'm so anxious. And I still get that before every lecture, before every seminar, before every presentation. Um, I'm, it's, I'm a naturally... I, I, I could be a hermit quite happily, I think, and never see another human being. Um, however, I quite enjoy this. And it's almost like allowing this other version of me to exist. And it's that other version of me that came into existence when I took on that lectureship, because it was much easier for that guy to give a two-hour lecture, because he was a bit of a blagger and could get away with it. Um, whereas shy old normal me was a, a different person. And actually that, that, that having a slightly different persona, that slightly different character, that slightly exaggerated version of yourself is something I've recently noticed in other colleagues and other lecturers, people I've admired as great public speakers for years. I suddenly realised actually in real life they're, they're pretty shy and socially awkward too, but they've got this character that they, they, they put on, this mask, this performer, this, this similar but different version of them, but not too exaggerated because that's a bit much and that can become confusing and odd, uh, but this, this other version. And that, that lesson, I think, it's only something that emerged in hindsight, but I think anyone, anyone nervous of public speaking, anyone who's, who is kind of shy or is a bit socially awkward and doesn't want to give a presentation. Just remember, let that other version of you do it. It's much easier, much, much easier. Um, but at the time, it was a one-year contract. So I'd get back to the slide. Sorry, I went off on a complete tangent there. Um, good tangent, mate. It's a good tangent. Good tangent, great. Um, I, I was saying yes to projects. I got That was around the same time I started working in Spain with, with one of our mutual colleagues. Um, a, a, a much, much lower paying research post popped up and I applied for it because it kind of kept me in sight. It kept me in view. And this was the first time I mentioned how, how calculating Lawrence has been about his career um, throughout. This was the first time I knew what I wanted to do. I was in my dream job and I wanted it to carry on. I didn't want it to end, but it did end. So I thought, how do I get back on this train? This was the first time I had a career in mind. This was the first time I knew what I wanted to do. So I did everything I could to get there. So I took on whatever job I could do to keep in sight. Um, during, during one of those um, short-term contracts, I got randomly asked to cover a colleague who was um, teaching something completely different that I'd never really read much about or done anything on. But I said yes, because it seemed like a way of getting back into that world. Um, and again, those skills of just being able to talk through slides competently um, came in very handy for that year. Don't tell the students from that year. Um, I might have to cut this bit out of the podcast as well. Um, <laughs> but at the time, um, again, it was, it was just pushing those communication skills and it was developing those skills. Um, but showing that willingness to be flexible while keeping in sight was definitely what put me in good stead when the next step came along when I was all ready to give up and become a farmer um, I, I there was no I couldn't see an academic future for me and all of a sudden this job opened up it was largely administrative largely managerial which sounds awful in it it can be um, but I applied for it I did, don't think I was at the time, I didn't think I was remotely qualified for it. I didn't think I'd stood at stand a chance of getting it. Um, there are far more qualified people out there than me. But I took a punt, I applied for it, and I, I, I got it. I got it, and I've been doing it since. And I think there's, there's a moral there somewhere that no one feels ready for the jobs they're applying for. Um, so just, just do it. Just apply. Just do it. Um, you'll be great. But getting back to the core subject um, of how we get into science communication before it gets even darker outside, um, that kind of leads us to us intersecting 
as human beings for the first time. Well, you mentioned um, at the beginning in the intro that we both worked on the Stonehenge Riverside project. Interestingly, it was in completely different contexts, completely different places at different times. Um, Lawrence was there digging up house floors. I was analysing them in a lab in Sheffield. So while we had overlapped at various stages of our career, we'd done the same undergrad at the same university at different times. Um, it wasn't until what, 2015, 14, 15, 16, we met. So it feels like longer um, in my mind. (laughs) Um, And we went to a conference in Oslo together and it was, the rest is history, but we'll carry on telling the story. Um, And as you mentioned earlier, Lawrence, we worked together in Spain and I was starting a project in Greece. So I thought that Lawrence, he can churn out a lot of geophysical grids in a day. Let's get him to Greece and do it in 42 degree heat. It'll be fine. Um, And to cut a very long story short, it's through all of that that we became friends and that's where it started there's no there's nothing contrived here it wasn't like oh here's i need another similar looking guy to start a podcast with um oh lawrence you look a bit like me let's start a podcast um, <laughs> generic bearded archaeologist yeah, that that's, should be our uh, that's, that's podcast what, name that's what the world needs more of generic white bearded archaeologist um so <laughs> it, it it was none of that there was no there was no method to our madness it was just we got on we work together well in the field. Um, our skill sets complemented each other. We do have a tremendous overlap in terms of skills, but we have sort of peripheral skills. That I, I, there are things that Lawrence can do that I can't do without in my research career. And I'm sure there's one or two things I can help him with from time to time. Um, but we just got to know each other. And it was through through getting to know each other on one of those projects in Spain that one of our, one of our dear friends... Um, Dr. Chloe Duckworth um, suggested or gave us the opportunity to join her in the most random sequence of events that have ever happened and probably will ever happen in in my life. How do you remember that time, Lawrence? Um, yeah, it, it was just, I've got a thing and you guys want to be involved. It might, it's linked to time team. Y- yeah, okay. Sounds good. That, that, that's the conversation I remember. It's why I'm an archaeologist today. It's what part of actually. That's, I should have put that in my slides. Watch so a, a British staple on a Sunday afternoon. You'd, you'd have your supper, your, your tea, and then you go and you'd watch Time Team. So it'd be an hour-long program, and it was the they'd have three days to investigate an archaeological site. I don't know why three days. No, no reason why it was three days, but just three days. And they had a team of experts, and they'd go and investigate a whole different. Every week, a different site, prehistoric, medieval. They even went over to America a few times and did some um, sort of uh, early early founders uh, sort of settlements. But it was a staple on a Sunday. And it was a reason I am an archaeologist because it got me interested in archaeology. So I think we both loved it. And the, the idea of getting, like spending time making some proper science communication about archaeology that would be viewed by hundreds of thousands of people across the world um and and also being in an opportunity to shape that in the we traditionally in the uk there is there's quite a typical kind of person that was presented as an archaeologist on television you had to wear a knitted jumper granted i'm wearing one of those today but (laughs) you you had to be a bit quirky you had to have a regional accent derek don't talk too loudly um (laughs) you're right um and yeah, and that was, oh, you had to be very posh. And there was no normal sort of just nice down-to-earth people that just could talk archaeology and enthuse people about it. They were that didn't have a gimmick. And I think I quite liked that opportunity to, to communicate and get in with Time Team to just be showed. It's all right to have normal people presenting archaeology. We're not all weirdos. We're all quite, quite nice people and we, we can be enthusiastic without ha- having a gimmick. Um, but also I think we were both quite shy still at that time. Like we were still, and it's 2016 was quite a long time ago yet. So we, we didn't want to be front and center. Well, I don't think we ever really want to be front and center. Even the podcast isn't about us, but what we did like was the ability to, um, to shape and push and promote discipline or a person or a subject. And, um, so what we decided to do, we didn't, also, we didn't want to spend time faffing around with video, so we thought, what's, in, what's an easier media podcast? Um, and there was a whole host of reasons why we did it. Um, partly because 
we thought it would be an interview format. We could we could brew, we got loads of great connections up until this point. We could we could do the first season at least with all people that we know. It's tr- quite straight straightforward. To do. So it's just a bit of organising a time. It's relatively. Um, it's as I say, it's not about us. It's relatively low cost. There's a bit of website hosting costs. There's a bit of um, sort of um, media hosting costs for the podcast. But there's a bit of time. It's a little bit of social media to promote yourselves and get out there. But it's it's pretty easy. There's lowish skills involved in terms of of recording it. All we've done today is download a, a free software. We're recording ourselves. Derek will hopefully. Well, I say lowish skills. I'm drastically undermining Derek's ability <laughs> Thanks, to to make a podcast. But the uh, reality is, mate, it's it's it, it didn't take you too long to learn how to no. mush together a, a couple of soundtracks. Um, <laughs> And then that creativity, that fun, the fact that we get on so well, um, and our links. So our our, um, our logo is being created by um, a GIS officer from a national park. Our theme tune is being created by a friend of a friend of mine. It's pulling in on all our contacts and um, just make having fun, being creative with it, and just making the most of it. But not making it work, not making it overcomplicated. And I don't think we've ever been stressed by it or not wanted to do it and that's that's the absolute key and I think as I think our USP is that we're quite laid back we're quite friendly we're quite casual and that's all we ever want our podcast to be in terms of of outputs and 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 our science communication yeah and I I think for me you, the, the thing that you you mentioned there Lawrence about the the fact that we knew some amazing people. One of the best things about being an archaeologist and the best things about doing field work and travelling around and spending time with colleagues and friends and lots of time, like, staying in shared accommodation, sitting around, drinking a, a glass of wine or beer of an evening and uh, just chatting about stuff is you hear some incredible stories. You hear some some really good tales, some really good um some really interesting things about people's lives existence and existences and careers and the idea of being able to build a platform where people could share those stories in in a in a way that goes beyond i i'm an excavator and i dig some holes to talk to someone whose whole job is to fly around in a biplane taking photos and um someone else's job who is like a professional diver swimming around looking at stuff underwater all of these little niche parts of archaeology that come with tales stories narratives we could weave them into this podcast and ultimately we could get away with saying very little and let other people say lots of stuff and have a successful podcast career it's great Um, (laughs) so in a way this is the first time in however many years it is since we started doing the podcast where we've talked about ourselves in that kind of way we talk about bits of news we talk about um what we've seen in the world of archaeology that interests us but it's always been about other people. It's always been about the stories that other people have to tell. And I think that's my favourite thing about having started the podcast. And it's never felt like work. Whenever we do it, it tends to be an evening, much like this for us now, where it's sort of seven or eight o'clock of an evening. We may have a, a glass of wine or scotch while we do it. We chat to someone. We just have a conversation. And then I skip work for an hour and edit it the next day in my office when I'm supposed to be doing something else. Please don't listen to this, Mark, if you can hear me. Uh, They They don't don't listen. listen. (laughs) But doing that and having, having our own platform and having our own identity has paid for itself over and over again there has been some financial investment from both Lawrence and I it does pay for itself now actually which is quite nice um yeah and we so we set up a little patreon didn't we and we've got it's just slowly grown slowly grown and we just kept people trickling and and a massive shout out to all our patrons because we we have a few but they basically what little we get which is amazing allows us to wipe, wipe our face which is all we need to do we're not looking to make money out of it we're just looking to share our incredible discipline and so we're very lucky to have people to help us do that and yeah and and ha- having that support and that platform is probably what's opened the, the the doors to us that have been opened in the last few years um and we mentioned time team already and that's that's something that's become increasingly dominant in terms of what we've been doing um those of you who who listen to the podcast will notice we've not put out that many episodes over the last few years 
you could argue we've been coasting somewhat with the podcast. Um, <laughs> but in truth, we've been very busy um, with Time Team and we've been fortunate enough since um, COVID, since Time Team had a massive crowdfunded revival um, through um, lots and lots of really good online community engagement and promotion. Um, it's come back as a wholly archaeology fan funded tv show that's available free to the world via youtube and i think the, the last episode went out what three days ago and it's already up to half a million views on youtube which is which is incredible and being a part of that i don't think we'd be a part of that if it wasn't for making our own luck with the podcast lawrence what do you think no i think you're absolutely and that's that's kind of what we wanted wasn't it we wanted to stay we one of our key things was we need our own thing because with that initial pilot that derek mentioned all those years back it wasn't about us we were just extras we were archaeologists in the in the background um but we were like that was really fun how do we get to do more of that we need our own thing and that's where we started to but we, we also wanted it to be us we were we didn't want to be contrived about it we didn't want neither of us as Derek said we're both dyslexics neither of us are particularly good at learning a script or reading something back or or, or being a newsreader so our whole thing is about we we wanted our own identity and that identity is and we want to be visible but we wanted it to be true to ourselves and I think as a result it's been quite organic and quite genuine and I think that's part partly why we've done all right with it <laughs> and yeah I, I i i think i'm almost confident enough in what we do to say we, we're at the point where we're all right at it now we're, we're getting mm. there and uh and we now do it alongside our actual day jobs which is which is the dream but like at the moment i'm in my dream job and i get to do mad online tv and podcasty things for fun it's great this is this is there's there's a saying and i can't remember the exact wording along the lines of you it's, it would be nice if you knew the good times when you're in them or the the, the the heyday of your life i kind of feel like we're in it at the moment lawrence and it's it's really nice it's really good um but we do have to merge that along with our regular careers and there are there are elements to going on YouTube to half a million people and saying stuff that don't necessarily gel perfectly well with my day job. Um, like as a, as a, as a researcher, you follow the evidence, you, you don't go beyond the evidence, you, you present, um, you present the best possible academic discussion you can that leads to the most well-versed, well-referenced conclusion. But quite often in the world of communicating science, you have to fill the gaps in, you have to give it some flavour, give it some life, give it some colour. You have to add some narrative to things that can be otherwise quite dry. And that that can be quite a, a difficult challenge, certainly working in an ap academic post. And um, an element of that is being comfortable with my colleagues' ridicule half the time, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, be because because I will say things in a, in a psychom environment that I wouldn't necessarily say in a lecture environment. I will take interpretive liberties here and there that make the, the story and the narrative more engaging. But I would argue that there's, there's, and I would argue that there's an ability to that in a way, in that um, in the UK, certainly, and I suspect the same applies in the States, archaeology as a discipline, archaeology and anthropology as disciplines, aren't the most economically alluring of disciplines for people who are going to pay thousands of pounds a year to study something. Um, you have to really want to do this. You have to love it. You have to want to engage with these stories. But I would argue that without archaeologists and anthropologists, humanity would be completely in trouble. Sorry, I was going to swear there, but I realised I probably shouldn't. Humanity would be in massive trouble. And we can see from the past 70 odd years of, of humanity struggles that um, misinterpreting the past, misunderstanding heritage, misunderstanding or mis-selling where people come from and why is a tremendous tool for people who will manipulate cultures, societies, politics. Um, we see that with pseudoscience at the moment and the kind of rise of the, the, the racist histories around Egypt and the, the various kind of re-emergences of harsh colonial narratives and things like that, that if archaeologists aren't 
if archaeologists and anthropologists aren't here to correct the story and correct the narrative, the world as a whole is in a lot of trouble. So I would say I see that every archaeologist and anthropologist has a responsibility to get as many people as possible excited about doing archaeology and anthropology, studying it, thinking about it, reading about good research, reading about um, good theories, well-researched theories, not random crackpot ideas about aliens and various things. We have a responsibility to keep the record straight, but we also have a responsibility to keep people interested. And if we can keep people interested, people will study it, people will go on to have fairly moderately successful careers and become maybe financially viable at some point in their lives. But they'll 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 keep the world going forwards in a sensible and hopefully non fascist way, which is the kind of deep down requirement and responsibility of every archaeologist and anthropologist and i went off on a massive rant there so i'm going to hand over to you sure it was good mate it was good it was all strong (laughs) stuff um and from my perspective i guess this is this is where we differ but a a lot of what derek just said is rings true to me but obviously as an employee from from a government department um I, I, I unfortunately my internet cut out a bit Derek so I don't apologies if I'm repeating you here but um something you said to me in the past is we're, we're only relevant if the public are interested in us and and that's such an, a, a key point if if the public don't care then we're not going to get money we're not going to get resource and we're not going to be able to do um do what we love and so what I've looked, what I'm able to do with our career ruins and communicating science is is make sure that the public are interested and we can share that story and create content for my employer, Forestry England, videos about understanding the landscape, reading um, reading lumps and bumps, learning about victory in Europe Day and the and the anniversary in an anniversary podcast. Um, but yeah, sharing is caring when it comes to the historic environment and intertwining that with well-being and engagement and education and recreation is, is something we should be doing as as land managers and, and, and man- managing organisation. Um, but yeah, it, uh, just raising the profile of the historic environment, it often comes um, as a forgotten cousin with these sort of landowners. It, it's, it's a constraint. It's something they have to work around. Actually, it's an opportunity. And this is why the public bloody love it. They We can, t- we can tell a decent story story about it and it, it, heritage is one of the key things that everyone is, is keen and interested in so let, let's raise the profile of that but also we raising money to, to, to deliver more work as well so the more visible we are the more opportunities there are to get funds and and just one, one thing it, it seems quite big-headed but I just wanted to include I didn't write this we had just had a successful bid from Arts and Humanities Research Council for a project which is looking at um, quantifying heritage capital so the value that the historic environment brings to outdoor sites so often people talk about nature and trees and carbon and ecosystem services but actually there's a load of archaeology it's all sat on top of a stage of a historic environment none of it's natural it's all curated by human activity um so we want to, we, we want we're looking at ways of quantifying the value that the historic environment brings and that doesn't necessarily have to be monetary but it's all it could be social value it can be well-being values all the all these other things but someone wrote this as, as part of the project team as one of, as one of the the, the invest lead co-investigators someone wrote this as as my introduction to the team and that that bit that says um so he's a lead historic environment advisor is experienced heritage professional working in public with public bodies and protected landscapes and a broadcaster delivering heritage content to a diverse audience and um that's that's a key part of this narrative and it's not about broadcasting but it's about showing that i i've got experience of engaging people and understanding how people perceive the historic environment and how to teach them about the historic environment so we can start to think about what value they might put to that and yeah it's just nice it that wouldn't be in there without career and ruins and time team. And it's nice to see other people recognise that. I, I think that's that was one of probably one of the driving forces of the podcast generally in the beginning was we kind of both felt that the these these people, these colleagues we had had such interesting stories and such passion and such love for the subject that if we could just get them get them to be in a position where someone might hear them, then we wouldn't have to work too hard it would it would sell itself people would kind of listen and enjoy and in terms of kind of growing the podcast that it's been a fairly slow burner in that respect but it does seem to kind of permeate that 
people find these interesting people interesting so they they want to learn more but in terms of kind of the, the ways in which we've occasionally served to boost our numbers and give a slightly bigger platform to all of the people we've interviewed on the podcast we've tended to do some fairly shameless tie-ins with various things that have given us a little boost here and there um doing we did a youtube video with a colleague on star trek archaeology which i think served quite well to kind of hook people in you get more youtube views that way by kind of tying <laughs> into a social phenomenon um we did a similar thing uh what was the other of oh, the um the minecraft archaeology of corf castle yeah. video we made um so tapping into kind of very easily searchable things um has helped but giving a platform where interesting people who love what they talk about can tell their stories has has kind of worked in itself i think yeah, I think also it's the, the, the media type and platform is an interesting one. So my my PhD was looking at harvesting Instagram data about the new forest where I'd worked previously and understanding what people's un- appreciation and perception of, of the, the new forest was. So I harvested two, it was the fourth most Instagram location in the country, 250,000 posts that I looked at. And of those, 100 had history attached to them. And the rest were in single figures in terms of archaeology, heritage, um, and other things like that. So, um, what what, I'm, what I learned from that, and I think what's quite clear is that actually some social medias aren't the best platforms for engaging different audiences, new audiences. Um, often they're echo chambers. People will look at what they are interested in and won't necessarily go searching for new stuff, but also they'll regurgitate what they're being told to regurgitate. It's popular culture, it's popular culture. A national park is about ponies and trees and wildlife and not about archaeology. So um, the podcast allowed us to produce a media content that that perhaps people will listen to because they I know, I'm going to give a shout out to my old manager here Helen she's not an archaeologist she works in rec- um, in access for, in forests um, and she wouldn't probably look at our at my my Instagram for what I uh, to learn about archaeology I think that she's got better things to do than that but she does when she's doing the ironing listen to our podcast and she uh, every time I catch up with her she's like oh I was fascinated by um, the uh, museum curator on Nui or um, other things like that. So and, and so that's immediately perhaps brought a subject and, a, and a, a, an engagement to someone that wouldn't have ever learned anything about archaeology and Nui in the middle of the South Pacific or very unlikely. Um, so it's, I think that's what nice thing about the podcast, using different media, using YouTube. Um, I, I, I don't know anything about TikTok. I'm, I'm too old for that, but maybe there's, there's a role for that. But... It's, I, I think there's a way of diversifying media and I wouldn't see lack of engagement on sort of social media posts as I, I'd see that more reflective of maybe thinking about different ways of sharing, sharing your content and your information. A question we often get is how do we balance accessible science communication with academia or professional roles? Yeah, it's, it's not an easy challenge, definitely. And I, I, I think a good example of of kind of walking that line and, and navigating the, the kind of the tension between telling a, an exciting story that people want to hear and staying true to the archaeology is is um, a few years ago, Lawrence and I produced um, Four Time Team, an episode um, on our project in Greece. And we we did all the, the filming with colleagues in Greece and we we basically created this this special episode of Time Team on this this project. And that project obviously has multiple stakeholders from multiple countries, um, colleagues in different parts of the world with very different attitudes about how we should tell the story and what that story should be. And I think the the thing I learned from that process is if the if the archaeology is interesting, there, then you can usually tell a good story without having to overtell it. And I, I was very guilty in the first iteration of that episode of wanting to tell a more exciting, bigger story. And I, I think I took some liberties with interpretation and some of the wider kind of tying it into this god, that god, and blah blah blah, and and being quite quite over the top with it. And through various conversations with colleagues, I came to realise that actually if we just told the story of the archaeology, 
it would still be really interesting. And in fact, it would be much more interesting and much more different. So I, I'm still learning that one, I think, where, where the line exists between spinning a good yarn and tying into something interesting or strapping a bit of kit to the back of a pony and staying true to the research. But something I learned through that process was actually people are quite interested in the 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 doing of it. They're interested in what normal archaeology is. Things that are normal to us on a daily basis are alien to a lot of people. And just presenting that in an interesting way, in an understandable and clear way, is often enough. And it that process kind of taught me that lesson in in real time, I think. Yeah, I'll just add to that as well. There's a, there's a time and place for everything so you you can have fun and you can be silly and you can get a news team out and get a headline provided it's not a you're not portraying a a big headline sort of groundbreaking story so yeah you can you can do a silly thing with a pony and but actually we did a genuine geophysical survey on a site where you can't take cars and we did it quicker than we would have done it if we'd done it manually so there was a, a genuine question and a genuine research output but we just took a bit of a liberty of having fun with a local pony, um, but and you can you can grade it and you can you can apply it where appropriately and and what Derek gave was at the top of this scale and what we did with the ponies at the bottom of the scale and there's plenty of stuff in the middle and there's there's plenty of just simple press releases that you can do that are factual that give the information and you don't need to sensationalize it as Derek says it's just um we did a thing and it is interesting and this is why a lot of what we do is sensational anyway so why not just tell the story <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> not us just archaeology yeah archaeology generally <laughs> yeah. nice caveat <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to say a huge thanks to Han and the rest of the Anthropology Society at Stony Brook University in New York for giving us an excuse to tell our career in ruins. Also, keep an eye out in the next few weeks where we'll be sharing information about new episodes and some fascinating career in ruins. <laughs>